Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Before I start, I just want to welcome three new members. We do a little uh, ceremony in the spring uh, welcoming new members, but I'd like to at least point them out as they have joined. Uh, Kim McKay, where are you? If you could just stand up for a second. Christian Hayden, you could stand up. And John Marshall. Welcome to our community. It's great to see a large number of people out for this. Uh, tomorrow is certainly a historic day. The first, second inaugural of an African American president, so I'm going to celebrate that. <laughs> but today I want to focus on a bizarre question I heard swirling around the first inauguration of President Obama. And that question was, is America now post-racial? <laughs> <laughs> Some people say, well, I mean, if a black man can live in the White House, doesn't that mean we've overcome racism? Of course the answer is no. Racism is a wound that cuts 400 years deep in this country, and it'll take a lot more years to acknowledge the injustice and heal the wounds. Despite some progress, corporate leadership is still predominantly white. Blacks are thrown into prison at an abnormally high rate. People of color suffer more acutely from poverty and unemployment than any other group. And you know that I could go on and on and on with this. Racism is clearly something that still festers in our hearts, in our institutions, and in our ways of thinking. It's everybody's work. It challenges us all. It's our work here, and it's my work as well. Now, I've approached this work through history. I read history. I teach history. And I've learned from history that one of the most powerful tools a dominant class has is control of the narrative. Because history is generally written by the winners. So now you've got another white guy talking about race. I'm not going to change that. I have a limited perspective. It's a perspective that's been affected by unearned privilege due to my gender my race, my class. Much of the history I've read is written by dead white males. Some point, I'm going to be a dead white male. <laughs> and I'm not going to change that. And my voice is just one voice. It's just part of a larger dialogue that has to go on. But I have been lucky, however, to have been given, to begin with, books that analyze racism from the perspective of the oppressed, from slaves and soldiers, from scholars and revolutionaries, from poets and politicians, who happen to be people of color. I've read the words of Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass and Maya Angelou and Malcolm X and W.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, Huey Newton, Bell Hooks, and I want to read more. They help me grow. It helps me speak of difficult things, and it grows my commitment. My commitment grew most of all during five years of being a director of diversity at a small private school where I taught for two decades. With modest success at nurturing sort of multicultural literacy, if you will, and modest, I mean modest. But in doing that work, I owe a lot to people of color who opened themselves up to me, who shared their pain and anger, who supported me, who enlightened me. Some of you here at the Ethical Society continue giving me these gifts, and I thank them and I thank you. I'm grateful. Of course I make mistakes. I won't always express myself clearly, probably not today either. And I'm certainly not going to say all that has to be said. My perspective is limited and my time is short. So I ask you to forgive my errors and work with me. Now today I am going to focus on black and white. This is just one part of lifelong education about multiculturalism, because multicultural work involves all races, of course, but it also involves differences in ability and age and ethnicity and gender and socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, religion, and so on. It's hard, transformative work. It involves deeply personal experiences and it challenges ethical relationships, and it requires courage. Now this binary of black and white is particularly challenging to this nation. As the president himself surely knows, we're still just beginning to heal the wounds opened by centuries of slavery, discrimination, and segregation. 
Talking of this may make many of you uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable. And it should. Look at the realities. But I offer my words not to inflict, but to try to uplift, which is a challenge. I hope they inspire you to take a little bit more time to practice anti-racist activism. How you do that is up to you. Because everybody is unique. Everybody has their own experiences, their own wounds, their own hopes, and their own dreams. So how do you, today, here, now, approach this work? Are you primed to be anti-racist activists? You just can't wait to do it? Or are you saying, oh no, not another diversity lecture? Do you feel paralyzed by the topic? Does it stop you from bringing out your best? Does it hurt? <laughs> Wherever you are in relation to this discussion on race and multiculturalism, I hope my comments are of some use to you. Wherever you are in this. Now what I'm going to hope to share today is as follows. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. First of all, I'm going to try to say that we simply need a more candid, robust dialogue around issues of races that includes not just voices from within ethical humanism or our history, but from an evolving collection of communities in the Philadelphia area. Second, I'm going to speak of a particular term that Du Bois used that captured some of the experiences of some African Americans in this country. It's called Tunis. Tunis. Then I'm going to explore white privilege and power and a version of Tunis that I think many whites experience. And I'm going to end by trying to suggest some ways we can overcome this tunis and more robustly engage the multicultural work. That's what I'm going to do. Now, to a big extent, anti-racist activism is about getting more people to the table, getting more people in the conversation. A hundred years ago, Teddy Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington sat at the table in the White House for a meal. And the next day, the white press savaged the president, and TR never touched it again. Multiculturalism in this country has been squashed as soon as it's raised its head from early on. As Obama sits at the head of the table now with world leaders, I find this poem by Langston Hughes that was wrote, written in 1922 particularly poignant. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Now Hughes expresses very well both the exclusion and shame involved, the exclusion that many people of color have felt and also the shame that many inheritors of privilege feel. I think it portrays a mix that is very unique to America because our form of racially constructed, of, 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 of socially constructed racism seems odd to parents to people who have never experienced our particular form. We do have a very peculiar form in this country. Daryl Davis is somebody that I've met who lived overseas for most of his first decade. He's an African-American man whose father was in the military, and he was unprepared for the racism that he confronted in America when he came here at 10. He joined a Cub Scout group, and in his first month of being in that group, marched in a parade to commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. And this is what he wrote about it. I marched right along, by the way, this was in the Boston area, I marched right along with my fellow Cub Scouts, totally oblivious to the fact that I was the only black participating. I even got to carry one of the flags. Suddenly, rocks whizzed by. I was being pelted by rocks and other flying objects. I turned and to my surprise, saw they came from some of the spectators, even children along the parade route. In my naivete, I reasoned that some strange people must not like the Cub Scouts. <laughs> it wasn't until my Cub Master and my den mother ran up beside me and shielded their, me with their bodies that I realized that I was the only Scout under attack. 
Now, a very persistent question was planted in Davis's mind from that moment on. He said, how can total strangers hate me just because of the color of my skin? As an adult, he looked for answers to that question in the world of the Ku Klux Klan. He wrote about this controversial series of face-to-face -face conversations, shared meals, family gatherings that he had with these hooded embodiments of hate. He got some criticism for doing this. But transformed by Davis's humanity and courage, many of these Klansmen left the Klan and left him their robes, which he displays when he gives his lectures now. This strange short story, I think, sheds light on particularly U.S. attitudes and realities of race. Academics and experts agree race is a social construction. It's not fundamental, determined, or a fixed quality of individuals. Biology may undermine, underlie some of the definitions, but race is fluid, it's a matter of degree, and it's the product of a selected emphasis on a tiny bit of our genetic code. Forcing anyone and an essentialist concept of race undermines the integrity of the individual. It undermines their respect and the freedom, which is the essence of what I think ethical humanism is about. But in ethical humanism, how good are we at anti-racist activism? Certainly our humanist history encourages us to take risks for the sake of social justice. Felix Adler, who founded ethical culture, took risks to try to improve racial understanding. A century ago, we speak out for the, quote, victims of a cruel race prejudice, such as is entertained against the colored people of the South by the more brutal whites. He visited black colleges to try to build mutual understanding. He was one of the four ethical culture leaders to sign the NAACP founding charter. He and W.B. Du Bois were the two representatives from the United States to go to the 1911 Conference on Race in London. And through his work, he empathized deeply across racial lines. He wrote, I remember a long evening which I once spent in the company of a leader among the colored people, one of the best men I have ever known. I looked at, at that night into a suffering, sensitive human soul, and I tried to put myself in his place. I realized the hardship of his lot and the anguish that I myself should suffer should I be in his position. Now many ethical culture leaders over the last hundred years have tried to nurture such empathy and communication and activism such as Al Black, who was a leader in the New York area. He worked on a whole host of issues, including employment, youth, juvenile justice, police bias. In the 60s, Walter Lawton spent a number of years in the South in the AU Southern Pro Pro Project on Race. More recently, Lizelle Burns up in Brooklyn has conducted workshops and seminars. Arthur Goldberg has done the same for, for decades. There are many, many consistent anti-racist activists. But ethical culture also has to admit our own inconsistencies and shortcomings. And it's not easy to read in our history the fact that our founder didn't escape the racism and ugliness of his time. We have to admit this to move forward. We have to admit that Adler, for example, claimed that whites were superior in that, quote, his family life is purer on the average than that of a large number of colored people. And he believed that whites were better in their ability to, quote, to distinguish between criminal and innocent. With at least a nod to the historical context, he said, in the consequence of the long centuries of slavery, their family relations, meaning those of the blacks, are often unstable, while they are apt to shield the colored criminal from the arm of the law. We could unpack that for a long time. But we have to be honest with the fact that the roots of racism run throughout this country in our own tradition if we're going to pull these roads out one by one. And it humbles me, it reminds me of how hard the work's going to be, it reminds me of the fact that I carry racism within me today. And it reminds me that ethical culture has to open our conversation to the voices of many, many people. Now, when we invite African Americans to tell their stories, we have to appreciate that this is asking a lot. As a high school director of diversity, I remember when many parents and students 
were wary of my invitations? How would their words be interpreted? How would they be heard? Would they be accused by overly sensitive whites of playing the race card? By even mentioning race? This is just one of the many reasons why some African American friends of mine prefer to remain quiet. It's a survival tactic. But it can also carry a heavy price. There's a poem by Paul Lawrence Gumbar that explains this, that is again another powerful poem. It's called We Wear the Mask. We wear the mask that grins and lies, it hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts we smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise, we wear the mask. So how many African Americans walk through the doors of the Ethical Society here, or any Ethical Society, having to wear a mask due to the history, the expectations, or the fears? How many wounds of racism are still deep and raw? We want to ignore them, it's ugly. But ignoring a wound can kill. From the Birmingham City Jail, King wrote his famous speech, and he, in that he compares racism to an infected boil within the civic body. I think it's an incredibly important and apt analogy. He says that it needs to be exposed to air and to the healing light of human conscience. Activism lances that boil and allows the infected pus to be released. Now this metaphor, like the reality behind it, is ugly. We don't want to look at it, but we have to, because the wound still hurts. They are long, long roots of this racism. Remember, the first Africans were brought to this country in 1619, one year before the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock. Nearly 400 years of institutionalized racism driven by economic greed that killed millions of human beings. Whips, chains, branding irons, separation of families, humiliation were followed by more subtle forms of discrimination and humiliation and discrimination. But for what's more depressing is that these roots are still producing the strange fruit of racism. The economic and political disenfranchisement of people of color today is linked directly to this history. And it's not ancient history. This is something I'm so amazed. People think, oh, it's way back then, it's over. I have a friend at the Washington Ethical Society whose father was born a slave. It's not that long ago. You can see me at coffee hour, I'll help you with the math. It's true. <laughs> it's true. A hundred years ago, Du Bois began the soul of black folk with the words, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. A century later, that color line still exists. And it's not just between whites and black, it's within the souls of many African Americans. It splits them in two. It violates their wholeness. It's a division of consciousness. Du Bois explained, it's a particular sensation, this double consciousness. This sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. One ever feels this two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals within one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Now such inner divisions, which are both caused by and cause further racism, attacks the integrity and psychic unity of many people in this country. Many people I've talked about say they're trying to feel a part of a predominantly white culture and yet also feel different from it. And more subtly, even well-meaning whites get caught in this trap. And I love this portion from his book, Souls of Black Folk, where he says, he talks about them. He says, they approach me in this half-hesitant sort of way. 
I mean curiously or compassionately. And then instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem? They say, I know an excellent colored man in my town. Or I fought at Mechanicsville. Or do not these southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile or I'm interested or reduced to a boiling simmer as the occasion may require. To the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? I answer seldom a word. For too long, the problem of racism has been described as a problem that is a black problem needing a black solution. As an African-American friend of mine at my school confided in me, she said, victims of racism are not the ones that should always have to confront racism and fix racism. Often we're tired and fed up. I've found that in life, the victims of racism are always called on, called on to educate and understand the perpetrators. So they carry a double burden. They're victimized by racism and they're asked to solve it. Often they are burdened with what Lisa Delpit calls being outside the culture of power. They're drained by this constant navigation through implicit hidden codes in linguistic forms or communication strategies or the presentation of their self. It's how you speak and how you feel and how you dress and how you write. And it's full of codes and assumptions. What types of codes and assumptions do we have in this ethical society or in this city that reinforce this experience of Tunis for any African American that may be seeking a new liberal, progressive, or humanist home? I think the answer to that question requires me to examine my own white privilege and to deconstruct it. Personally, I think I need to better understand white privilege, resistance, my own wounds, my own experience of Tunis as a white person. So first, privilege. We all know that whites have inherited racial privilege. For most people of white complexion, they can ignore racism as a daily fact. Most African Americans cannot ignore racism. It's an omnipresent part of their experience. For many, not all. Peggy McIntosh, who was white, anybody read her? Any hands? Just a couple. She wrote a book called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. She explains, I was taught to see racism only in individual acts of meanness, not in invisible systems conferring dominance on my group. White privilege is like an invisible waiting, weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. As far as I can tell, my African American coworkers, friends, and acquaintances do not have the same access to these coping and navigation tools. Here are a few of the privileges that Peggy McIntosh talks about, and I wonder how many people here feel like they have these privileges and who don't. I can, if I wish, arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed. I do not have to educate my children to be aware of systemic racism for their own daily physical protection. I can do well in a challenging situation without being called a credit to my race. A traffic cop pulls me over or the IRS audits my tax returns and I can be sure that I haven't been singled out because of my race. I can take a job with an affirmative action employer without having coworkers suspect that I got it because of my race. I can worry about racism without being seen as self-interested or self-seeking. She continues. Whiteness protected me from many kinds of hostility, distress, and violence. Perhaps most whites in the United States think that racism doesn't affect them because they're not people of color. They do not see whiteness as a racial identity. But a white skin in the United States opens many doors for whites, whether or not we approve of the way dominance has been conferred on us. 
Now, for a number of reasons, a lot of whites do not get involved in anti-racist activism. And I want to see which one of these might apply to us. They all apply to me. They still affect me. First, many whites stay out of the multicultural discussion because they find it difficult and unpleasant. We're not well prepared. We fear saying the wrong thing. Some whites, compassionate and deeply committed to social justice, can have thin skin and feel burned when they enter the diversity dialogue. They feel that they become sort of punching bags for 400 years of history. A second reason why whites stay on the sidelines is that they feel that it's not their place because they're not people of color. Who am I to talk about this like some sort of expert? I don't know racial discrimination. Let's hear from people who have lived it. And often well-intentioned whites simply hope to defer to people of color the right to teach us about multiculturalism. And of course it's good to respect the wisdom of those who experience discrimination. But it doesn't mean that whites have nothing to contribute to this dialogue. A third reason for white avoidance is that whites often don't feel privileged. They don't feel they hold power over people of color, and this complicates things, and there's some legitimate factors involved. Many whites feel that the power situation has been reversed, that people of color hold the power, especially when talking about race. That really confuses things. And in part, this is a generational thing. I know many of my white students who temporarily forgetting about the realities of being black in America are envious of the power, popularity, and authority of their African American friends. And this is why that word wannabe was a big part of multicultural discussions over the last couple of decades. A fourth reason why some whites avoid multiculturalism is simply resentment. They feel abused by political correctness and reverse discrimination. And they react to multiculturalism with either apathy or racist backlash. I think this is behind some of the criticisms of Barack Obama that verge on the bizarre, the birthers. Just a few years ago, in my home state of Maryland, Governor Ehrlich said the following phrases on radio and when challenged, defended them in the newspaper. He said, I reject the idea of multiculturalism. Once you get into this multiculturalism crap, this bunk, you run into a problem. There is no such thing as a multicultural society that can sustain itself. <laughs> he didn't get real. <laughs> I think a lot of forms of resistance to multicultural work, work from blatant to subtle grow out of the wounds of racism. Even whites have been cut in two in some sense. Now, in borrowing Du Bois's concept of Tunis, I know that the Tunis of people of color is exponentially more painful than my Tunis that I experienced. But I still think there is a mirror of this, that if we don't figure out, we're not going to get very far. Sometimes it arises in questions friends ask me when they say, Hugh, how does it feel to belong? How does it feel to fe be comfortable with who you are? How does it feel to be privileged without knowing it? In other words, how does it feel to be white? Now, often whites are surprised by these questions. They kind of sting like accusations. Frustration and anger can swell. But the tunis arises. In me, I am both a friend and an enemy in this discussion. I'm both a solution and a problem. I'm both a black ally and a white oppressor. And I just want to yell, oh no, but I'm different, right? Elizabeth Denethi, a friend of mine who works on this issue, explains that many whites feel caught up in a dynamic that reduces them to, quote, a stereotype or an unwilling but guilty participant in ill-gotten gains. And this is the double-edged sword of white privilege. In her words, the inequities in such privilege are obviously painful to people of color. But they can also be painful to white people, many of whom feel that it strips them of their individuality and turns them into unappealing stereotypes. Wendell Berry, who writes in The Hidden Wound, says, if the white man has inflicted the wound of racism upon black men, the cost of it has been that they would receive the mirror image of this wound into themselves. 
As the master or the member of a dominant race, he has felt little compulsion to acknowledge or speak of it. The more painful it has grown, the more deeply he has hidden it from himself. But the wound is there, and it's a profound disorder, as great a damage in his mind as in his, so as in his society. Whites have to transform their own wounds, their own tunis if they have it, into activism. So how are we to do that at the Ethical Humanist Society? How are we to grow anti-racist activism? This is a long discussion. It's not going to be finished today. I only have a few minutes left. So I'm just going to leave you with a couple of ideas. First of all, it's not going to happen by simply recruiting more people of color or diversifying our programs or our committees, but that can help. It's going to happen if all of us, myself included, regenerate renewed commitment to a continued education and activism on multiculturalism. So I'm going to start with five pieces of advice, and they're kind of broad in channel, but it's the beginning of the discussion. First, heal. Heal. This is something African Americans have been doing for decades that many whites don't understand, that they may have wounds inside them that are far from healed. For some of us, often a good approach is simply get over it. That is good for some of us, get over it. James Baldwin said, I'm not interested in anybody's guilt. Guilt is a luxury we can no, a luxury we can no longer afford. I know you didn't do it and I didn't do it either. But I am responsible for it because I'm a man and a citizen of this country, and you are responsible for it too for the very same reason. Anyone who's trying to be conscious must begin to dismiss the vocabulary which we've used so long to cover it up, to lie about the way things are. So we can't overlook the pain that many whites have suffered due to systemic, historical, and current racism. White racist multicultural work has to include an examination of a mirror wound in whites. We shouldn't wallow in self-pity, but our wounds have to heal so they don't fester or paralyze us or kill us. When I became high school diversity director, my own wounds became clear. It's weird how this work sort of brings things up to the surface. I had to do some real personal work I had to overcome fears and racist residue that I found deep inside of me. As a young kid in the 60s, I developed irrational fears, magnified by cultural stereotypes of the angry black that have existed in our culture for all of our history. The fury of my black classmates, justifiably militant because of the moment, frightened me, threatened me. I mean, I got beat up a couple of times. Lunchtime was the worst. Ironically, at Martin Luther King Jr. High in Berkeley, California, I would scamper to the chess club, which was a primarily white enclave, to avoid getting beat up. Here's my chess background. So I struggled with this paradox of feeling both victimized and being labeled an oppressor. It's a bizarre paradox. It's a tunis. Now, of course, my wounds were probably not as deep as those who bullied me, but they were real, affecting me decades later. And the healing is difficult and necessary work. In Du Bois's own words, he says, I insist that the question of the future is how best to keep these millions from brooding over the wrongs of the past and the difficulties of the present, so that all their energies may be bent towards a cheerful striving and cooperation with their white and black neighbors towards a larger, juster, and fuller future. So we have to heal. Four more pieces, briefly. Second piece of advice, read, listen, learn. Read books, know history. Invite many to the Ethical Humanist table. Start a discussion group. Attend a May workshop. Diana Waters and I are planning. Listen to voices on a deeper level than you've ever listened before regarding inequalities of education, income, crime profiling, and the assumptions and stereotypes. Third piece of advice regarding anti-racist activism. Own it. Own it. It is yours. Make it your own pet project to become empowered. Don't let it be something that cripples you or makes you afraid. Make it be something that you're proud of. The next time somebody says something racist, whether it's in your own living room or out on the street, say something. 
Practice saying it. Get used to it. It's not easy, but it can be done. And it can be done well, and it can be done in a way that makes you feel like you're making a small difference on a day-to-day -day basis. That's part of the fourth piece of advice. Act. Ethical culture believes in deed before creed. We say it over and over and over again. And many of you do so much here at the ethical societies. And you know that we can't wait until we're certain to do something. We believe that acting and reflecting is a constant process. So dive into this work, guided by your reason and your compassion. Do something. You may make a mistake. Take a risk. Then rethink and act again. You can't wait until you're certain because this topic is tough to be certain about. So write letters, advocate, speak out, connect to people who are different than you. And finally, my fifth piece of advice is to have faith. Anti-racist activism, all multicultural work, we do better if we carry deep within us an unabiding faith in the inherent worth of every individual, including ourselves. If you can find energy and courage working with others in ethical humanism where we truly respect each other and ourselves, you might find yourself transcending your fear or your apathy or whatever is keeping you from doing this work in ways that surprise you. It has surprised me, but it's ongoing. When I first heard of the term, the phrase in ethical culture, we have a phrase that says, bring out the best in others and you'll bring out the best in yourself. Bring out the best in others and you'll bring out the best in yourself. And I thought to myself, that's it. I really, truly believe that. And I do. It means so much to me. But it has an interesting angle in this discussion. My last piece here. I know that other people are wonderfully unique, beautiful, complex. But what I didn't appreciate was how this affected that phrasing. If eliciting the best in others elicits the best in myself, then wouldn't eliciting the best in the broadest diversity of people elicit the broadest strengths in myself? Diversity is not something you put up with, it's something that helps you grow. It is our strength that we have avoided for too long. We have to learn to work on this better. And if we do, we can transform a nation's history of racism, humiliation, and exploitation into one that honors the inherent worth of others and builds social justice. So strengthen your anti-racist activism and your commitment. Heal, learn, listen, own it, act, and have faith, because it's everybody's work. Thank you very much.